Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we come before the Lord this morning, and as we open the word of his scripture and of his prophet, shall we seek his guidance and his blessing so that we may more correctly understand that which we need to do at this time for ourselves, for our families, and for this earth's history. Shall we seek his face in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these many hours of the Sabbath that you have granted to us so that we may correctly understand that which you would have us to know so that we may completely worship you in spirit and in truth. Our minds have been darkened through many years of misapprehension, questions, and sin. Please forgive us of the sin in our lives. Help us so that we may draw closer to you. But direct us so that we may have our righteousness, which stinks, replaced with the righteousness of your dear son. Help us now, Father. Help our minds to be open so that we may truly worship you, so that we may thank you for all of the challenges and all of the blessings that you send our way to help us to understand what it means to truly be your children. Direct us now, guide us, we ask. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Now, over the last several weeks, we have had a theme going as we have been studying. We're going to get further into this theme today. The overarching premise of these last several weeks has been to examine the portions of Scripture that Mrs. White had stated were necessary for us to understand at the end of the world because this is going to represent what we're going to see at the end of the world. For us to be able to see something, we need to be able to understand it. For us to be able to understand it, we're going to need to accept what it is saying to us, and the need that we have in our lives for specific changes so that we may truly walk with Christ and walk according to that which God has presented to us in his word. Now, the following passages were presented on 24th of March, 1908, in the Southern Watchman. Faith, the apostle says, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1. The faith of the Christian rests on the word of God, which is a lamp to the feet of the people. Following its rays, they walk in the light, but those who reject the light, determining not to hear and obey, will be left in dark in the darkness of error. Where is it that we are to obtain this light, as it's presented in this paragraph? I can barely hear you, sorry.
In the word of God? Yes, in the word of God. Does that mean that we can set aside any portion of the word of God? No. no, that does not. So if we set aside a portion of the word of God, we are setting aside light. Correct. That, okay. The day of God's vengeance is just before us. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince that standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Daniel 12, 1. Here we are presented that when Michael, one who is like God, stands up, that that would be the beginning of God's day of vengeance. Would that be a correct understanding? Or am I misapplying something here? Would the that following? be a booker? Because as he st stands up, it's not that he's right away inflicting judgment. There is a process of him laying off his priestly robe and getting attired and coming and all that. But the following paragraph is quite clear. When the time of trouble comes, every case will have been decided. Now, the verse itself says, when Michael stands up, the great prince that standeth for the children of thy people, there shall be a time of trouble. So when he is standing, the time of trouble occurs. Is that a correct statement for, that we see from Scripture? Yes. So if the time of trouble has come, then every case will have been decided. Is that not what Sister White says? Yeah. Does that mean that mercy no longer pleads? Does sure. it mean that the time of the open time for us to repent of sin has then closed. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah. No longer will probation linger. No longer will there be mercy for the impenitent. Our own course of action is determining whether we shall be destroyed with the workers of iniquity or delivered with the people of God. The Lord is willing to help us. While his face is against them that do evil, his eyes are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayer. Here we would need to see 1 Peter 3.12. So, as a waymark, when the time of trouble comes... Every case has now been decided. The wheat and the tares that have grown together have now been separated. You now have those that are of the wheat. And you have those that are of the tares. And there is no further probation. What we need now is a living, active faith in God. You do not know, dear reader, that you will live one day 
longer. You cannot call even one hour your own. You do not know how soon death may feel for your heartstrings. Will you then let envy, hatred, and jealousy live in your hearts? Or have you gained one precious attainment after another until pride, malice, and selfishness have been swept away, and there remain the graces of the Spirit, meekness, forbearance, gentleness, and charity? God will help every one of us if we will take hold of the help that he has provided. What is the help that God has provided here? The light? He's provided the light. Yes. But is he also not providing for us that we may become seen as righteous by our faith in Christ? Yeah, that sounds logical. Now, the next five words are key. This is an individual work. If this work is individual, is our salvation found in any group? No. Is our salvation found in Christ alone? Yes, it is. <clears throat> Every man is to build over against his own house. You have nothing to do with the sins of others, but you have much to do with yourself. Take your Bibles and in humble faith, send your petition to God. Do not rest day nor night until you can say, hear what the Lord hath done for me. Until you can bear a living testimony and tell of victories won. All of this is incumbent upon us. One by one. We cannot say, I am a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My salvation is assured. We cannot say that we are a member of the movement. My salvation is assured. This is an individual work. Now we're given a couple of examples. Jacob wrestled with the angel all night before he gained the victory. When morning broke, the angel said, let me go for the day breaketh. But Jacob answered, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Then his prayer was answered. Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, the angel said, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and men, and hast prevailed. And we find this in Genesis 32, verses 26 to 28. Why is it important that Mrs. White is noting here the name change from Jacob to Israel. Isn't that the character change? Yes, but what else is it? Is this not the symbol of the covenant? A name change? Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
as Jacob had to wrestle individually, his wives, his children, his flocks, his servants, everything that he had were separated from him. He wrestled all night with an angel and was accounted as righteous. Did Jacob have great faith in making the statement, I will not let thee go except thou bless me? Does he not show his faith in this? Yes. Yes. Yes, he does. He, he had to have had the faith before he, he pronounced those words. And if he did not have the faith, what it would have happened to him? He probably would have been slain. So here he is accounted righteous because of his faith. And if he had not the faith, he would have been destroyed. He is a an active example of righteousness by faith. When the test on Mount Carmel was over and God had answered by fire, then it was that the prophet went up to the top of Carmel and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. An attitude indicating deep humility and earnest supplication. What prophet is being talked about here? Elijah. Here is Elijah. The priests of Baal and the priests of the grove have been destroyed. God has answered by fire. The people have answered and recognized that God is supreme. Time after time, Elijah sent his servant to see if in answer to his prayer, a cloud was rising, but no cloud was to be seen. At the sixth time, the servant returned with the word, right? Yes. Really? The seventh. Seventh. Seventh time, right? Correct. I said the sixth, just to oh, see if you I'm sorry. It. No oh, problem. <laughs> At the seventh time, the servant returned with the word, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. When we read this, we find this in 1 Kings 18, 42 to 44. Now, do these... Do these numbers stand out for anything symbolic for us right now? Those years, 1842 to 1844. Exactly. What, in our study of history, what had we recognized were occurring from 1842 to 1844? Had not the first angel's message been empowered, the second angel's message had arrived, was formalized and empowered, and had not the third angel's message then arrived by 1844? Yeah, I'm thinking also of the response of the purchase. Sorry. Go ahead, Angela. 
Yeah, I, I was thinking too of 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 the response of of, of the churches to this. There yes, were very few believed that they had been for a while, and then they decided they wanted to retain their own traditions and their own ways of doing things, and cast out the Millerites. Now you were going to say, brother. I was just thinking the midnight cry. Okay. All of which are good answers. But here is Elijah. Another representative of the faith that we are to have at the end of this world's history. Did Elijah stand back and say, I will not receive this evidence. I will wait until the heavens gather blackness. No, he ventured all. He ventured everything upon the token from the Lord and sent his messenger to tell Ahab that there was the sound of the abundance of rain. How like July 18th was that cloud like a hand for us? Was July 18th not a warning to the world and to the church of the soon approach of the day of God. Was this not a warning telling us to be ready? Oh, yeah. Like Elijah, were we to stand back and reject that evidence? No. Were we to say that we must cast out brothers and sisters that we don't agree with because, well, we just don't think that that this was really of God? I'd have to say no. We need the perseverance of Jacob, and we need the unyielding faith of Elijah. Faith that will take hold and not let go. Inspiration tells us that Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Yet the Lord heard his prayer. And why, <clears throat> and why should not the Lord be entreated in behalf of his people today? He will, for heaven is not closed against the fervent prayer of the righteous. The only reason of our lack of power with God is to be found where? In ourselves. What does this say to us, brothers and sisters? Many years ago, As I was beginning to examine different points before joining this movement, I was asked to remove myself from an Adventist church because I had disagreed with the pastor. There was a group of us that met together one Sabbath. And I asked a question of the ladies that were there in front of their husbands. My question was, did your husband need for to assist you in getting ready for your wedding? What do you think the reaction was of those women? 
Uh, no, you're supposed to be away from them. <laughs> Yet, as I have continued to study, Christ has not returned because the bride will not make herself ready. I have been asked many times, why, if this movement is of God, why do we not see the miracles that were accounted for in the early book of Acts and that were shown throughout Scripture? The Lord will listen to the fervent prayer of the righteous. The only reason of our lack of power with God is to be found within ourselves. How many fingers are now pointed and where are they pointed? God's power is infinite. Jehovah is willing to save. Are we willing to be saved? By many such a faith as these mighty men of God had in times past is considered old-fashioned. It is pronounced absurd, mystical, and unworthy of an intelligent mind. You don't understand. You need the doctrine, the doctor of divinity. You need to become better than God himself in order for the power to come to you. But is that the way it was with Jacob and Elijah? Did they have their degrees from the great universities of their time? No. Maybe a PhD from the School of Hard Knocks. Okay. Unbelief of the truths of God's word, because human judgment cannot comprehend the mysteries of his work, is found in every community in all ranks of society. Does this not mean that we find this even within the church today? It is taught in many schools and comes into the lessons of the nurseries. Everywhere the spirit of darkness in the garb of religion will confront the soul. Thousands who profess to be Christians give heed to lying spirits. And the time is not far distant when every soul will be tested. Can we avoid the test that is coming? It doesn't look like it. In the name of Christ, I would address you. Abide in the faith which you have received from the beginning. We must keep close to the word of God. There is danger in departing in the least from its instructions. We need its warnings and its encouragement, its threatenings and its promises. We need the perfect example given only in the life and the character of our Savior. When we look within Scripture, where do we find warnings and encouragements, threatenings and promises? You have to be a little more specific. <laughs> It's like they're all over the place. Okay. Of the books of the Pentateuch, 
which is the book most directly written to us for this time in Earth's history? Exodus? Leviticus? Leviticus? How many would say Leviticus? Or are we not to be priests unto God at this time? Yes. Therefore, we must be Levites at this time. It's supposed to be our message. Message to the Levites, right? Agreed. And how many warnings, threatenings, encouragement, and promises do we find, let's say, in Leviticus 25 and 26? For are these chapters not outlining to us today the blessings and curses that will come upon us if we are faithful in adhering to the law of God? Well, yeah, I mean, yes. In order to stand fast in the truth, we need to have a living, active faith in God and his word. Without such faith, it is impossible to please God. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Here we need to see Romans 14, 23. The faith that is required is not a mere assent to doctrines. We cannot just mentally say, yes, I agree with this. It is the faith that works by love that purifies the soul. Humility, meekness, and obedience are not faith, but they are the effects or the fruits of faith. Implicit trust in God's power to save and its effect on the life and the character do not come in a moment. These heavenly graces are acquired by the experience of years, by a life of holy endeavor and firm adherence to the right. The people of God seal their destiny. In Ezekiel, as in Revelation. The angel is commended not to destroy those that have the seal of God on their foreheads. A mental understanding, a mental agreement, a mental acceptance. in life and in character is there presented. Do not be afraid to trust God. Repl rely upon his sure promise. Ask and ye shall receive. Do not let go of the promise even though you do not see an immediate answer to your prayers. How many times has Sister White told us when we pray, we are to thank God for the answer to the prayer, even if we do not, in our minds, see the answer that we have asked for. The example from Daniel 9 is very simple. Daniel was in prayer. Daniel sought to understand the vision. Before he had finished praying, the man Gabriel, whom he saw at the first, had been sent to help him understand.
God sent Gabriel before Daniel's prayer was complete. God is too wise to err. He is too wise to make a mistake. And he is too good to withhold any good thing from them that walk uprightly. How many times today do we hear those stating, God made a mistake. I'm a man, I should have been born a woman. How many times does the world think that they know more than God? How many times do we find this within the church? Well, my pastor says this, and he has the time to study. Therefore, I should take my pastor at his word, even though it looks to be in opposition to Scripture. And put his God. word above God's word. And do that. And are we to do that? No way. Yeah, with the example given, our um, our detector should be going off really hard. Exactly. Man is erring. And although his petitions may be set up from an honest heart, he does not always ask for the things that are good for him or that will glorify God. When this is so, our wise and our good father hears our prayers and answers, sometimes immediately, but he gives us the things that are for our own good and his own glory. If we could look into his plan, we should clearly see that our prayers are answered in wisdom and in love. And through the temptations and trials of life, the promise will be fulfilled. I will guide thee with mine eye. Can we trust Jehovah? Can we trust our Heavenly Father? Amen. Is there any question whether or not we can trust him? Uh, not all, but some do. Right. Now, the next article that she provided is our accountability to God. God is committed to us sacred truths for which he holds us responsible. He has given us mental and moral faculties that should be developed by education into a well-balanced mind and a symmetrical character. But education alone will not prepare a man to meet the object of his creation. He needs the grace of God. Divine power united with human effort will enable him to do good and to glorify his creator. Few appreciate the value of man and the glory that would redound to God were he to cultivate and preserve purity nobility, and integrity of character. The value that God sets upon man is shown by the price that he has paid for his redemption. His love is expressed in that he has withheld not his beloved son, but gave him to die for a sinful race. Angels could not, by any sacrifice that they could make, accomplish the work of man's redemption. 
It was only through the suffering and the death of Christ that he could be restored to the favor of God. For our sakes, he knew no sin, was made an offering for sin. He was afflicted, insulted, oppressed. Arraigned as a criminal, he suffered shame, insult, mockery, a cruel and painful death. Sin is the transgression of the law, and death is its penalty. It was to save man from these that Christ suffered. Through his perfect obedience, the law was exalted. He will elevate man and give him rich and glorious possessions if he will respect the claims of God's law. But if he chooses to ruin his hopes of heaven by his stubborn sinfulness, he will lose these blessings. To choose to be a sinner is to refuse to stand before the throne of God, washed from the defilement of sin. It is to refuse the riches of eternal glory and refuse to be a joint heir with Christ to the immortal inheritance. It is to reject all of these and choose instead the sure consequences of sin, the sinner's fixed doom. How many are there today that are choosing sin over righteousness? Is that what we are seeking to do in these studies? Are we looking to choose sin and reject righteousness? I'd have to say no. How about the rest? Are we in agreement with Brother Ron? Amen. Yes, we are. Amen, yes. Amen. Amen. Those who might do good service in advancing the cause of Christ, but who use their talents and influence to tear down instead of to build up, will feel the wrath of God. Those that choose to tear down other brothers and sisters that seek, that seek to criticize, to backbite, to gossip will feel the wrath of God. Does this mean that we are not to stand up when someone is teaching error? No, that does not mean that. In fact, we should we should express concern uh, for their teachings if they're not in line with scriptures. Amen. They will experience what Christ expressing said. concern is not is not chastising them. Right. Amen. Are we all in agreement with that? Amen. Yes. 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 They will experience what Christ suffered in saving men from the penalty of the broken law. The value of man and the measure of his accountability can be known only by the cross of Calvary. He who represents himself to be the, to the sinner as the one strong to deliver will prove himself mighty to execute wrath and judgment upon every unrepenting son of Adam. He who holds the worlds in position, who weighs the hills in scales and the mountains in a balance, who taketh up the isles as a very little thing, will show himself mighty to avenge his unrequited mercy and his spurned love. Those who flatter themselves that God is too merciful to punish the sinner have only to look at Calvary to make assurance doubly sure. 
that vengeance will be visited upon every transgressor of his righteous law. Okay, a comment from the chat, James 5, 11 to 12. Why? It says, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Do any of us, does any of God's creation, man or woman, have the ability to judge the law? Sorry, no, I don't think so. We might have the ability, but, but it's not we're, we're not supposed to do that. I mean, we just read it, right? I believe it, it, it was said most succinctly in the chat, not at all. How can right. we how can we attempt to judge the law of the infinite, all-knowing, all-seeing Jehovah. I'm so I'm sorry, brother. Um, do I, um, <clears throat> she said 12, 11 and 12 of James. Right. James 5, 11 and 12. Is that what, what she read? That's what I read, brother. Okay. Uh, so you said James 5, 11, and 12, right? Oh, I'm sorry. It's James 4. <laughs> Thank you, William, for correcting me. <laughs> I, was just, I was just looking at it. I, you know, you, me it too. It sound like the same word you, you wrote. Yeah, I was, like, I was going, that didn't sound right. Now, wait a second. <laughs> Let me read that again. Yeah, because I just read James 5, 16. And, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, there. And then I flipped the page and didn't even realize I flipped it. So. Yeah, that's actually a paragraph <laughs> in four. <laughs> Sorry. I apologize, Dwight. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> the, the whole point of these studies is for us to be able to interact. We need... Iron sharpening iron. So can we say thank God for Zoom? <laughs> <coughs> yes. I would That's say it's so. all about his timing, not ours, right? Amen and amen. The short space of time allotted to men here is, ex is exceedingly valuable. Now, while probation lingers, God proposes to unite his strength with the weakness of finite man. Does probation linger when Michael stands up? Um, no. No. <clears throat> Here, God is proposing to unite his strength with the weakness of finite man. In seeking to be united, is this not God again entering into a covenant with his people? Uh, can you repeat that, please? In seeking to be united, God's strength with the weakness of finite man, is Jehovah not seeking 
again to enter into a covenant with his people? I would say yes. I would too. Now, here we are. God is seeking to enter into a covenant while probation lingers. Before the Spirit of God is withdrawn, before Michael stands up, before the time of trouble, he seeks a people that will accept and keep his covenant. Is this not an awesome promise that is presented before us today? Oh, yeah. Uh, I got an observation from our last little bit here, that Please. James. So um, what was that? What was that chapter and verse? Number again? James 4, 11 and 12. James. Right. 4, 1, 1. Yes. Ah. Uh, for, your, for your information. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And very direct. We should so educate ourselves that we can serve him intelligently. Every fiber of our being is needed. Our heart, our mind, everything about us is required so that we can serve him intelligently. Those who have cherished skepticism may by proper discipline of the mind, learn to cherish faith. Those who truly love God will desire so to improve the talents that he has given them, that they may be a blessing to others. And by and by, the gates of heaven will be thrown wide open to admit them. And from the lips of the king of glory, the benediction will fall upon their ear like the richest music. Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, 34. Thus the redeemed will be welcomed to the mansions that Jesus is preparing for them. where their companions will not be the vile of the earth, but those who through divine aid have formed perfect characters. Every single, every sinful tendency, every imperfection has been removed by the blood of Christ and the excellence and brightness of his glory, far exceeding the brightness of the sun in its meridian splendor is imparted to them and the moral beauty the perfection of his character shines through them in worth far exceeding this outward splendor they are without fault before the great white throne sharing the dignity and privileges of the angels i have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. In view of the glorious inheritance which may be his, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark eight thirty seven. He may be poor, yet he possesses in himself a wealth and dignity that the world could never bestow. The soul, redeemed and cleansed from sin, 
with all its noble powers dedicated to the service of God, is of surprising worth. And there is joy in heaven in the presence of God and holy angels over one sinner that repents, a joy that is expressed in songs of holy triumph. What kind of a work is this that is to be done? Is this to be a work that is due to our membership with a group? No. It's an individual work, isn't it? It is definitely an individual work. Now, to carry on with what we had been looking at before, Okay, sorry. Give me a moment. I'll get the the right one opened. As we were going through this last week. Here, from an unpublished document, Mrs. White states, A great and solemn responsibility rests upon all parents to instruct their children so that they may form characters of which God will approve. It is the responsibility of parents to instruct their children. The Lord himself has prepared the way for parents, giving them special light by which they may understand the claims of his law. This light must be appreciated by parents as coming from the Lord for the saving of both themselves and of their children. God has given us his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But our faith in him must be more than a casual faith. It must be definite, not founded on feeling, nor depending on sight, but established upon the word of God. Although we cannot always see, we may always believe that Jesus Christ is our personal Savior. And that he saves us from sin and transgression, but does not save us in sin. For the promise, Peter testifies, is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Acts 2, 39 and 40. The work which parents should do is to show their children the remedy for sin and transgression, to exalt the law, and to show its binding claims upon every child and youth. Teach them that the cross of Christ did not abolish the law. For Paul declares, I had not known sin, but by the law. Romans 7, 7. The law and the gospel unite to save the souls of the perishing. So if the law and the gospel are united, is this not another covenant with God? Yeah, we call it the new covenant. So the law and the gospel, the law being the transcript of God's character, 
the gospel being the good news, the promise of salvation, and the warning of ignoring the offer are united together. The law is the instrument which convicts of sin, but has no saving qualities with which to save the transgressor of the law. The condemnation of law is death to the sinner. The soul that sinneth shall die, Ezekiel 18.4. But help has been laid upon one that is mighty. God sent his own son into the world in the likeness of sinful flesh, to condemn sin in the flesh. Christ came not to abolish the law, for it is the expression to all mankind of the character they must seek to form, but to condemn sin in the flesh with a voice that will reach to the end of time and by the marks of the crucifixion which he will ever bear upon his divine person, Christ proclaimed his abhorrence of all transgression of God's law. The moral defection of the human family because of transgression is deep and broad, but the angels in heaven are commissioned to proclaim that there is a remedy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 The keenest human discernment cannot understand the length and breadth and depth and the height of the plan which reaches from everlasting to everlasting, a depth which reaches to the lowest state of human degradation and misery, a height that reaches to the throne of Jehovah. Those who looked upon the pallid face of the Son of God could have no just conceptions of his sufferings. As every divine and human aid failed, the noble sufferer stood alone. The terror of darkness and despair gathered about his soul. When Christ cried out, Eli, Eli, Sabarakini, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His divinity did not come to his aid to help him that his case was perfectly free. Not a ray of brightness illuminated that dying struggle. Not a pang of the death sentence was spared the Son of God. The word of the Lord was, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The sentence of death which God had pronounced against every transgressor of his law must be executed against the Son of God. There's no more finger pointing here the way that that statement reads. All of those fingers are pointed at me. Complete obedience is the only condition which meets the requirement of the law. The question is asked, is God a man that he should lie? God has given the definition of sin. His law is the rule of government. God says, do this and thou shalt live. 
But to the disobedient, he says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in the things written in the book of the law to do them. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God has given the promise to those who do this law will be rewarded, not only in the present life, but in the life to come. He declares just as decidedly that those who do not obey his requirements shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on them. By lips that never lie, the obedient are blessed, and the disobedient are pronounced guilty. There are only two classes in the world today, and only two classes are recognized in judgment. Those who violate God's law and those that keep the law. Two great opposing powers are revealed in the last great day of battle. On one side stands the creator of heaven and earth. All on his side bear his signet. They are obedient to his every command. On the other side stands the prince of darkness, with those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. It is the purpose of these studies for us to make our choice of where do we stand. It is the purpose of these studies for us to examine the cost, to count the cost. Where will we stand? And where and on whom will we believe? The wickedness that fills our world is the result of Adam's refusal to take God's word as supreme. He disobeyed and fell under the temptation of the enemy. Sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Is it not true that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Can any one of us say that I'm a good person? I have title to heaven. God declared, the soul sinneth, it shall die. And apart from the plan of redemption, human beings are doomed to death. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. But Christ gave his life to save the sinner from the death sentence. He died that we might live. To those who receive him, he gives power that enables them to separate from that which, unless they return to their loyalty, will place them where they must be condemned and punished. Christ is the sinner's only hope. By his death, he brought salvation within the reach of all. Through his grace, all may become loyal subjects of God's kingdom. Only by his sacrifice could salvation be brought within man's reach. This sacrifice has made it possible for men and women to fulfill the conditions laid down in the councils of heaven. God's word declares, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But God does not desire the death of any one. At infinite cost, he provided for a man a second probation. 
he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Should not those to whom the light of truth for this time has come place themselves in close connection with God, using their capabilities to advance the work of soul saving? Should not the one who possesses an understanding of the scriptures impart the knowledge given him to those who know not the truth? Upon every believer in present truth represent, rests the responsibility of working for sinners. Is this statement not written to us today? More for us than those that was actually written for. So is this statement written for those that choose to believe that salvation is in the corporate church alone? Repeat that, please. Is this statement written for those that believe that salvation is found only within the corporate church? I would have to say no. This statement is for each of us today. This statement is for us to take to heart. God points them to their special work, the proclamation of the third angel's message. Was not the Adventist church raised up to give the proclamation of the third angel's message? Yes, sir, it was. Yet, since 1844, has that message been being given? It has not. No. They, the believers in present truth, are to show their appreciation of God's great gift by consecrating themselves to the work for which Christ gave his life. They are to be stewards of the grace of God, dispensing to others the blessings bestowed on them. He who has found comfort in the word of God is to share this comfort with others. Thus only can he continue to receive comfort. One day I listened to a conversation between my mother and a sister in reference to a discourse which they had recently heard to the effect that the soul had not natural immortality. Some of the minister's proof texts were repeated. Among them, I remember, these impressed me very forcibly. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes 9.5 Which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and the only potentate, the king of kings and the lord of lords, who only hath immortality. 1 Timothy 6.15 and 16 To them who by patient continuance in well-doing in well -doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Romans 2, verse 7. Why, said my mother, after quoting the foregoing passage, should they seek for what they already have? If the soul sinneth, it will die. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is nothing that we can do save faith in Christ that is going to give us immortality.
But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. We read in the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, What mean ye that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, also the soul of the son of is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. If the father sins, is the judgment then placed upon the son? No, the son doesn't pay for the sins of the father. Unless he continues in those sins. Unless he continues in those sins. That's right. So which answer are you looking for? <laughs> well, you've already answered it, haven't you? Well, I thought so. I thought you gave a good answer. And I believe Sister Angela continued and gave a good answer. But if a man... He's right in line. Exactly. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither has lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, and hath not oppressed any, and hath but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, and has spoiled none by violence... <clears throat> hath given his bread to the hungry and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed his judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He surely shall live saith the Lord behold all souls are mine the soul of the father also the soul of the son is mine the soul that sinneth it shall die here again she chose to repeat Ezekiel 18.4 also verses 5, 7 to 9. Old Testament history agrees perfectly with the new. After light has come to us through the scripture, we are inexcusable if we do not walk in the light. For an unseen influence is drawing the soul to obedience, that it may bear witness to the truth. So here again, should we choose to set aside the light of the word that sin is upon us if we choose 
to walk in the light. All of the light that is given. We will be drawn to obedience. And the soul then will bear witness to this truth. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in them. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. 1 John 3, 8 and 9, 22 to 24. Now, if we continue to commit sin, if we choose to commit sin, knowing the light that God has given, are we accepting Christ or are we accepting the adversary? This is the kind of question that we face day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. It is essential to practice the principles of restoration. A Christian spirit must be maintained in all of this. The man, woman, or child who is deviating from the path of strictest rectitude must have their duty placed before them. In this, we may be called mean, narrow, and cowardly. But is it cowardice to do right? And shall we seal our lips and suffer sin to rest upon a brother because of this? If we see a brother or sister in open sin, are we to remain silent? I think not. We're too confronted. These careless, slipshod principles are leavening the entire church. Yes. There is faithful work to be done in this time, work that has been strangely neglected. Young men and young women whether in high or lowly positions, have an influence for good or evil upon those with whom they associate and with whom they come into daily contact. Their words, their habits, their purity of conversation all show on whose side they stand. The promise of God is, if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, he that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in him my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord. 
Everything is to be done as in the presence of a holy God. Right principles are to be maintained when, when dealing with those who are small as well as with those who are influential. There is to be no haphazard work done in the service of God. The reason why so many difficulties arise is that those who complain the most, who require perfection in others, exalt self and excuse their own defects. In God's word, we read of the qualifications which must be possessed by those who connect with his work. Here again, Ezekiel 18, 5, 7 through 9. If we are be to be connected with the work of God, we're going to need to understand these admonitions that are given. God requires moral perfection in some, right? Oh. In, oh. God requires moral perfection in all. Right. Those who have been given light and opportunity should, as God's stewards, aim for perfection and never, never lower the standard of righteousness to accommodate inherited and cultivated tendencies to wrong. Christ took upon him our human nature and lived our life to show us that we may be like him by partaking of the divine nature. We may be holy as Christ was holy in human nature. Why then are there so many disagreeable characters in the world? It is because they do not suspect that their disagreeable ways and rough, impolite speech is the result of an unholy heart. We ought to be holy even as God is holy. And when we comprehend the full significance of this statement and set our heart to do the work of God, to be holy as he is holy, we shall approach the standard set for each individual in Jesus Christ. Did Mrs. White stutter in any manner in this paragraph? Was she not exceedingly clear as to our duty? Oh, oh yeah. Perfectly clear. Do we have any question then? that God requires moral perfection in all. Yes, that's what we see. Is there a question to that? Do we have any problem with that statement? None from me. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments with what we have covered today? Shall we then close this meeting with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing that you have provided in these admonitions in making clear this portion of this prophecy of Ezekiel. Help us today so that we may be able to more perfectly represent your character in all that we do. Direct us now. Guide us. Because we have need of you. This is an, in, an individual need. But as we come before you together. We know that together our need of you is very great. 
Therefore, as two or more are gathered, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to request of you knowledge, compassion, and understanding so that we may more truly represent you in all that we are to do. Be with us now. Direct us, we ask. For this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.